But my question was, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my question was, the, per the perception is that the higher sensitivity speaker, and you have your quarrels with how sensitivity is rated and how manufacturers specify it, yes. but that the higher sensitivity speaker sounds livelier, less compressed, more the dynamic. Odds, the odds are that it can sound less compressed because literally you are not compressing the signal. Okay, yes. so that's it. Yeah. For tr if it's truly more, se the more sensitive all, speaker yeah, is... That's if you're playing loud enough for it to start compressing. If you quick play oh, okay. levels, then it's not going to be... It's not relevant. Uh, no, not so so relevant. The, the speaker that's, let's say, truly 90 versus the speaker that's truly 85, the 91 won't sound more dynamic than the not 85. until you start pushing. Really? The sound of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I defer to you. I mean, there is, uh, well, okay. there's always buts. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. The marketing guy, once when I was at Kef, he came down asking all these questions for one of the brochures. And he asked this question. And I give an answer and go, but, and then he gives all this <laughs> alternative explanation. He says, Andrew, stop, stop. <laughs> there are no buts in marketing. <laughs> well, then don't come to the engineers and ask the question. Just make it up yourself. Um, which they do, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm creating enemies here, so... <laughs> Why, there, there's maybe more friends than enemies, so you'll, you've got to protect me as I walk out. There's marketing people out there? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, there is another factor. Um, when you're looking at distortion characteristics, mm -hmm. so as soon as co current starts flowing through the voice coil, it creates, obviously, a magnetic force that reacts against the fixed magnetic field of the motor structure. And it will modulate. But, you know, that is, let's say, not infinitely stiff. So as you put your force field from the coil itself, it will modulate the force that the magnet is producing. So you'll get distortion. So if you can make that magnet structure, the, the motor strength, stiff, so it never gets affected, hmm. or you need less current to get to a particular sound level. Right. Therefore, you'll modulate it less. Uh -huh. So a high efficiency driver, kind of even moderate levels, if you haven't got the thermal compression, you will have also less actual intermodulation distortion. Okay. So there are always good things about trying to make things efficient, if you can. But there's always compromises. If uh -huh. you make the cone too light, it's not going to be a good cone. Uh -huh. right. so. so we were also we also had conversations about impedance because a speaker that's that's rated at eight ohms impedance isn't it doesn't stay at eight ohms at every frequency, and you have some really interesting graphs about how that all plays out. <laughs> it's shocking. Prepare to be shocked. So, there's a number of different speakers there. Try and follow any particular curve course. But, um, these are typical shapes of impedance. So when we talk about an eight ohm speaker or a six ohm speaker, what do we really mean? Because it almost never is an 8 ohm. It's not like a resistor. It's a very complex shape, both in terms of amplitude and phase. So any vented box and speaker will have this double hump at the bottom end. Then it will fall to some minimum value in the 2 to 300 hertz range. Then through crossover range, typically it will bump up. It will drop back down then it'll start to rise at the top end. So you can see pretty much everything follows that curve. There's variations, but it follows that curve. So how can we say from a complex curve like that what the impedance is? Yeah. So there's an international standard, the IEC, and they make a definition of impedance, which means if you want to quote a nominal impedance, then the minimum impedance should not drop below 80% of that. So for an 8 ohm speaker, <coughs> and if you're math challenged, that just means 6.4 ohms. Thank you. The math is getting easier. You've got to yeah, admit that. Yeah, I can follow that one. Um, so, and with a 6 ohm speaker, that's 4.8, and with a 4 ohm speaker, that's 3.2 ohms. If everybody played by the same if rules. everybody follows those rules. Yeah. But? But. It was a but. Um, 
There's not a single forum speaker or speaker rated at forums in any of those pots. And um, you can see that they all drop to about 3.2, 3.4, 3.5ohms. They're all really forum speakers. <coughs> but nearly all of them, except one, I wonder who this one is. Yeah. Take a guess. <laughs> um, claim to be 8 of them, well, no, two exceptions. They claim to be 8 of them, or 8 of them compatible. What does that mean? I a wise know. one. <laughs> I don't know what that means. We actually went, we, we created a fake email address and contacted one of <laughs> to say, Yo, you claim this in teams. Can you tell me what that means? What is, well, no, the question is on the form. Um, I have, I'm not sure if my amplifier will work with your speaker. Um, I'm worried it says I can't use a forum speaker. Can you tell me what the minimum impedance is? And they, they couldn't. Well, they said you have to speak to our marketing department. department. And they wouldn't really tell us. And, well, how do you <laughs> quote your impedance? Oh, it's the average. Average, what's the average of a curve like that? And shouldn't, shouldn't it be kind of 80% of the uh, nominal? And, oh no, no, I, we talked to our potential guy, said, no, you're totally wrong there. I can show you the documentation. <laughs> IEC 60628, whatever it is. Um, so the problem here is by not following the rules, you can make the speaker appear more sensitive. Because if, if you switch over with an amplifier from the speaker that's the lower impedance to the one that's higher impedance, the one that's been designed to have lower impedance will have a higher sensitivity. And on switch over, it'll sound louder. Uh -huh. But it's taking more power to achieve that loud. It's not more efficient. Nothing's it's more free. Sensitive. Nothing's free. Um, so we get into these problems. Um, this is why active speakers are such a good idea, because we get around this. But when you're designing a passive speaker to be universally able to be matched to any amplifier, you're going to have to worry about these factors. What is the real impedance? What does it drop down to? How much current have I got from my amplifier? Will it work? And um, there's one speaker in there that says six ohms, four ohm minimum. Well, that's not a six ohm speaker. <laughs> six ohm speaker doesn't have a four ohm minimum, but at least they're saying than what the minimum is. Right. Well, unfortunately, it was actually below four rooms. So that kind of nice try, don't, didn't quite get there. Um, but the other thing to look at is where are those minimum impedances? One of them is right at high frequencies. That, that's not such a problem because there's generally not much power in, the, in music mm -hmm. at those high frequencies. But we're in we that mid-range where there's a lot of mm -hmm. energy. So it, it's a kind of, how do people match? And even as a reviewer, as you're trying right. to check speakers with different amplifiers and vice versa, how do you know what you're getting? How do you know we've got compatibility? Mm. We're trying to build compatibility, but we don't know that we've got it. And that's, that's my kind of hobby horse right now. But what about a speaker that has, um it's, it's an 8-ohm speaker, but it goes up to around 20 ohms at like 3K and stays well, the, high no. impedance. Is that difficult to drive? Do. So this, no. Okay. If the impedance is high, even if you've got a different, difficult phase angle, which is a different topic, but it won't make it difficult to drive. Okay. Um, but you do have to watch if you've got wild swings in impedance. When you're driving from uh, a high output impedance, like a tube, tube amplifier. amplifier. Yeah, like okay. Not all tube amplifiers, but a lot of them. You'll get a voltage division between the, the source impedance, the output impedance of that amplifier, and the load. You will change the frequency response of the speaker. Mm -hmm. So trying to find compatibility between a tube amplifier and the speaker, every different speaker you put on, not only does that speaker inherently sound different, but its interaction with the amplifier will make it different, different. Mm. And so impedance, knowing the impedance is a, a critical factor in matching between speakers and amplifiers. 
So I want to, I want to change the subject a bit to the materials that are used for drivers. So whether a, a tweeter is a soft dome or a metal dome or, or a ribbon tweeter just to mix things up. But in terms of the design goals, for the sound of a speaker, because that's essentially what a speaker designer is. You're des you have a, thing, a sound that you want to achieve for a given speaker for a given price, what that speaker should sound like. And had, what's the thought process, whether I'm going to use a soft dome tweeter or a metal dome tweeter? Because um, one is not clearly superior to the other. Not always, no. Right, so um, it's not that the metal yeah, dome's always... Just, you know, a metal dome is not just a metal dome, a soft dome is not just a soft dome, a ribbon is just not just a ribbon. There's variations in quality in any technology right. used. And often, um, the very latest material is not necessarily the most appropriate. The latest and greatest is not? The latest and greatest isn't always, it's, it's what is applicable for the particular role that you're doing. So, when I first started at uh, Infinity, I was designing a speaker called the Prelude. And it was a thin aluminum column with four mid-bass drivers, two mid-range, and a tweeter, and then a self-powered, integrated side so, Yeah, I remember, a really beautiful sculptural yeah. Yeah. design. Yeah. Um, it was actually the first integrated powered subwoofer stereo speaker on yeah. the market. So, uh, I wanted to make this efficient and uh, because it's a self-powered subwoofer, it appears efficient because it's a built-in amplifier. You right. can drive it from the main speaker terminals. So to the world, it looks like it's just a super efficient right. bass driver. Um, so that means I can now make the mid-range, everything above 100 hertz, quite efficient. So I actually made it full 96 dB sensitivity, four ohms. And for real? For real, <laughs> and actually fairly flat. It was conjugated. So it wasn't a curve like that. It was like what we did at KEF with the KEF 1042, which was conjugated to be just four ohms, um, which was a problem because it was technically it was a good idea. We started telling people, you know, because this speaker impedance is now easy and there's not high current, un unpredictable current demands, it's so much easier to make with the amplifier. You don't need these humongous amplifiers that are designed to work into one ohm. And the dealer's going, don't tell anyone. <laughs> we want to sell humongous amplifiers that they'll drive one of them. Okay. Um, but this one was efficient and it was flat. So that, for example, if you're driving with a tube amplifier, you've got a nice efficient speaker and you don't get these interactions with impedance. But in that design, to get the efficiency level I needed out of these four five inch drivers, I made them a paper for infinity. Yeah. And everyone's going, you can't do that. Yes, I can. <laughs> I've already done it. Um, but it's because in that application, in that frequency range, I think it's 100 to 300, 350 hertz, paper was ideal. It was still as stiff as you need over that frequency range. You know, it's, its first breakup load was sufficiently high. It's very easy to get it light and partner it with a light voice coil. And since I've got four of them, I'm sharing load between all those voice coils so they don't get and they don't ring. And they don't ring. It's nicely damped, uh, at least over that range. So it worked really well and got lots of great reviews. But it did mean I was kind of persona non grata oh. for a while at Infinity because I'm not following the tradition of latest materials. Ah. So it's materials, you know, horses for courses. Mm -hmm. um, cheap metal domes tend not to be good. Um, so when you're doing a very low cost speaker, it's a lot more difficult to engineer um, metal domes to be as good as you'd like. Um, so I tend to stick with soft domes. And you know, I've got a lot of experience in designing soft domes. I am experimenting with metal domes. And of course, when I was with TAD, we had kind of, I would say, the, the ultimate metal dome, which was the beryllium dome. But not like the, the current beryllium domes, because this was um, made by vapor deposition. So it's a different manufacturing technique. And I can build complex shapes so both the material properties help in giving me the performance I want, but also the shape gives it. Um, stamped foil can't do that. So you, you lose something by having a simpler shape for uh -huh. the dome. Um, those work nicely. Um, I'm trying to, but I don't have access to that 
early manufacturing now that I'm not with Pioneer. Right. Um, so I'm trying different ideas. Um, but, as you, but as you said yesterday in your talk, that it, it, you just can't classify that metal domes are, are inherently better than soft domes or vice versa. You pointed out that there's a very expensive $125,000 speaker with a soft dome yeah, tweeter, awesome. yeah. right? So yeah. it's horses for courses or yes. whatever you want to say. There's yeah. no material that's inherently better. It's all part of the recipe. On average, correct. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can say that beryllium, it's the stiffest, lightest material. And if, if the goal is to have, the, in a metal dome, let's say, the highest break up level, uh -huh. the, there's only one material that's stiffer and not stiffer and lighter. It's the ratio. Stiffness to weight ratio determines where that break up peak is. So the two materials with the stiff with the greatest stiffness to weight ratio are beryllium and diamond. Right. Diamond has a modestly greater stiffness to weight ratio by about twenty percent. It achieves that by being very much more stiffer, but very much heavier. So that heaviness has repercussions when you come to design it. Mm -hmm. It tends to gently roll off towards the top end until it finally gets to its breaking mode. Um, but at least you could say those materials, if that's your goal, mm. they, they are the best materials. Um, but below that, in real world pricing mm -hmm. of speakers, then it's how well you design it, how well you mm -hmm. apply it. Um, same with ribbons. Or well, your, your new speaker, Karina? Karina. Karina, yes. which has a tweeter that you did not design. Finally. Uh, how did you... I had to succumb to sourcing. Did they tweeter. wrestle you? Did you lose a bet or something? <laughs> <laughs> I lost time. Oh. Because I'm doing so many other speakers. Oh. I kept putting it off, putting it off, and then I ran out of time, so I had to source one. So you just take this one. Well, I, I said, they said, you have to find a tweeter, so okay, I'll find one that works for me. For the company that you work for? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not just any old <laughs> and folded ribbon it's, tweeter. Um, it's been an interesting exercise because if we go back to designing for cars, for example, I know, this sounds pretentious, I know what I'm doing when I'm designing speakers. Right? I have a formula that I follow both from what the measurements should sound like and what I think the speaker should sound like. And can we call that voicing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You always have to voice. Um, there's no such thing as a perfectly measuring speaker. Be because the thing that confuses me about the whole voicing thing is, is that you d you're the sole designer for all of the ELAC speakers. Yes. But it's not, they don't really have a common sound. Do they? Do you, do you think they do? I'm not hearing them, which we're doing. This, especially this new speaker, like Karina does not that, have a yeah, common Yeah, I'd say sound. that one is a bit different than the others, but generally I think I'm trying to get an essence of the same sound. Okay. It's just, they'll never sound identical because they're different price points, different construction, different okay. <coughs> drivers. But I'm trying to get an essence of me in there. Because okay. this is the thing. That sounds like a perfume. Essence yes. of Andrew. Yes, essence of Andrew. Yes. Hey. Hey. <laughs> All um, right. <laughs> so, yes. when it comes to designing a speaker, I, I was brought up with measurements. You know, Kef, my first three or four years at Kef was on the research side, perfecting measurement techniques. You just measured, didn't design. I didn't design. Um, I eventually did. Um, became chief engineer. So I'm very experienced with measuring under all sorts of different conditions and limitations. Um, and how to do it if you don't have an adequate chamber, for example. Mm -hmm. At Pioneer, I had access to three really nice adequate chambers. One in Pomona, outside of LA, and two in Japan. The one in Pomona, it was mine. When I talked to other speaker engineers, they go, I have my own personal chamber. I was the only engineer using it. And it was huge. That's called um, chamber envy. <laughs> And, um, They're not all funny. <laughs> so he's, he's doing better than I. Yeah, I'm kind of outgunned here right now. Sorry. Um, so uh, if you don't have access to those facilities, there's other ways you can derive the response of the speaker, but it takes a lot of knowledge and work. But you still, I start by designing from my measurements, from measuring the drivers, measuring the system, 
And I look at that and set a goal for what that should be. Then I go and listen. Because you will never reach that perfect measurement goal. Not even on axis. <coughs> it always has some wiggles. And those are about six different speakers. They kind of, let's compress the scale. Six different speakers. They all look reasonably flat. But when you start to look, they vary quite a bit. Right? It'd be nice if I could make them flat. I can't. Even in an expensive speaker, I can't make it perfectly flat. So if I've got to deviate from perfection, which deviation am I going to accept? Mm. What am I going to give up in order to make one area better? Mm. That becomes my personal choice. So I, first of all, I measure. I think I've achieved a particularly good goal. I go and listen to it and I go, yeah, but something wrong here. It's not doing what I want. I will always then go back to the measurements and go, yeah, I, I, I was kind of too optimistic. I was caught up in the moment. The measurement wasn't looking really as good as I wanted it to look like. So let's go back and fix that. Then I listen. Is it better or is it worse? Was it that region that I was mm. listening to that was responsible for it? And you just keep going round and round and round. Measure, listen, measure, listen, measure, listen. But still you're left ultimately with a listen to determine which of the imperfections I want to accept mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and which I will not give up on. Mm -hmm. And um, so voicing, even for a measurement-led approach to design, is a critical stage mm -hmm. of designing a speaker. And I'm in a position that it's only me that right. matters. Only me that matters. Uh, I make the decision. Right. You get the credit and you get the blame. And I get the blame. Yeah. So, but for the Karina, Karina. Karina. Not Karamba. Yeah. Uh, it sounds sweeter. Yes, it does. You should listen to it, by the way. Highly recommend it. <laughs> um, it does. Um, well, when I had it at CES, it was not quite as sweet. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded a bit more forward than I wanted it to. Um, it doesn't do everything I want. It doesn't do what a lot of my concentric drivers designs do, um, but it does do other things. How much of that is the characteristic of mm -hmm. using a folded ribbon tweeter? I say it's the first time, it's not only the first time I've really used someone else's uh, tweeter, it's the first time I've used a folded ribbon tweeter. Mm -hmm. And typically they have a very different measured characteristic to a dome. They don't go nearly as low in frequency oh. as even a cheap don't yeah. do it. Oh, the yeah. small one it starts rolling off around two and a half K if you're lucky. It could be higher. Um, they can go higher, they don't always. A, a good soft dome these days, not difficult to get it to go out to 40 K. Um, they always seem to have a bump in the 10 to 20 kilohertz region, which um, is maintained off axis. The one thing that they kind of in a way are better at, the high frequency dispersion is Better than a dome. Better than a dome. Oh, the ribbon better yeah, than yeah, a dome. Okay. Yeah. And so, if it's also elevated in that region, it's also notes off axis. So, those kind of things you have to work around and engineer through. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the goal with this speaker. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I've done that as best I can in that particular speaker. Um, but the next goal would be okay, let me design my own. So, you know, when you, when you came to New York to, uh, to the CNET listening room with the, what we were still with Pioneer mm -hmm. for the SP73 was the tower and the books, oh, yes. right? So, and you and said- those were the Atmos. The Atmos speakers, runs, yes. right. Yeah. And, and, and Andrew said to me that the tower speaker and the bookshelf speaker sound pretty much the same, same. right? Yes. And I said, well, shouldn't the, the bigger one make more bass and play louder? And you, you really, you're downplaying that. So it's like you're saying... Uh, okay, so <coughs> design process. I always design the bookshelves in any range first. Get those right. Okay. To me, the tower should sound identical, as near identical as possible. Otherwise, why are you making everything sound different? If you've got a philosophy of uh -huh. what you want to sound like, 
you should endeavor to make them tonally as similar, tonally and to some extent dynamically as similar as possible. But the tower having bigger or more bass drivers and more volume um, can either allow you to replicate the sound of that bookshelf at a higher sensitivity level, okay. or with more bass. So we're back to that same And or? I often yeah. raise the sensitivity, but don't extend the bass. Really? Yeah. Cause so, because there's this expectation that the tower is going to make more bass. Right. It makes more bass. It doesn't necessarily go so a lower. lot lower. Because okay. 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 a lot lower is expensive, right? Uh -huh. And it means a total redesign of the drivers. Uh -huh. So, in the lower cost speakers, there's a very <coughs> simple trick. <coughs> Excuse me. I came up with. Have some water. Um, thank you. Thank you for stating the obvious. Okay. <laughs> so it's my job, actually. <laughs> I do for a living. Yeah, you do for a living. If I take three drive units, identical drive units, let me measure one, uh, put in a certain voltage, measure the frequency response at a certain distance. If I put three of them in series, and I just put the same input voltage, and I measure the frequency response, I would not be able to tell how many drivers I've got. If I'm sufficiently far away that I don't have directional characteristics. Three drivers in series behave identically to one, except the impedance level is tripled. But if I'm putting the same voltage level in and measure the frequency response, it'll be identical. So kind of a trick in the first instance is I take the woofer that I developed for the bookshelf, I take three of them, <laughs> I have three times the volume, three ports instead of one, put them in series, it will measure identically to the bookshelf. Um, I'll have some things, some problems because directivity is different because there's three sources mm -hmm. instead of one. But it will measure and pretty much sound identical, except it will play a lot louder. And in this instance, it's I can adjust and make it more sensitive. So that's the first trick. You have to do more than that because you got to. You don't want all three of in a two-way system. You don't want three drivers with one tweeter, right. because it will really mess you up at the crossover point. Now, if it's a three-way system, we've got mid-range. So if it's tweeter, mid-range, and a single woofer, then you do tweeter, mid-range, and three woofers. If the crossover point is low enough, I can just put them all in series. Uh -huh. Now, I might want to readjust impedance levels, so mm -hmm. I could redesign those woofers to have uh, a different impedance level, so that when they're in series, it's not too high. But that's the, th that's the essence of the trick that I pulled to guarantee consistency of sound. But do you find that other designers that have tower speakers with three, let's say, six-inch woofers, that they're designing it to make deeper and more bass? Yeah, you can always, you can always do some trading there and make deeper bass. Um, In other words, people have pointed out, I've had a thing recently about 15-inch woofers. Yeah. You know, the size matters question. So. They say, well, but if you had three six inches, it's the same area as a 15, and therefore the 15, you're just kidding yourself. But they will load into the room differently. So there's that factor to play. A speaker is not a speaker. A speaker is a speaker and a room. Yeah. So how they interface to that makes a difference. Um, but because of the trick I pull, because the driver in a two-way system, I do some extra crossover tricks, which I'm not going to tell you how I do Oh, come on. <coughs> so that it's not, a, it's not the traditional two and a half way of doing it. Um, but because I'm guaranteeing it's, in the simple sense, exactly the same driver crossed over to the same tweeter, it's guaranteeing it will sound the same right. from a tonality. So I want that commonality of experience. You know, oh, bookshelf's not big enough for me. I'll buy the tower. I know it'll sound the same. Or I can't accommodate the tower, mm -hmm. I can only have the bookshelf. Well, at least it'll sound the same. To that first order, that's what I'm trying to achieve in any of the designs. Because I've, I've seen ranges of speakers where you go, did someone else design that model in the range compared to that one? Mm -hmm. Because it's, why call it the same range when it sounds so different? Uh -huh. I'm trying not to do that. OK, another question. Do you have in mind like a, an optimal listening distance from a given design? 
Seven feet, eight feet, whatever? It tends to be about typically eight to ten feet is my typical distance. Okay. Um, now, that's not the first distance I measure at. You, know, you can okay. measure at one meter, extrapolate what it would perform like at okay. three meters. Um, but that's typically what I'll do. Okay. Um, but when you're working with concentric drivers, for instance, um, if you design it for a particular distance and then come closer and closer, you can often find you kind of you seem to lack driver integration. Basically. Even with a concentric? No. Oh, 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 no. oh not oh. conventional. Okay. Um, so one of my two-way regular speakers. Um, just driver integration can change. Um, concentric driver, not so much. Um, so you can come in near field and still get good integration between all the parts, mm. and so it will work in the near field.